last two, three weeks ago, I guess it was, the last time I was here, we were talking about um, the, uh, the gifts that God has bestowed on us as believers, enabling us to perform or to function according to his desire and will for us in a spiritual manner. And uh, I want to continue that thought both this Sunday into next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to do some uh, work together in trying to help you identify what your spiritual giftings are. Uh, we talked about the uh, spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians uh, 12. We talked about the ministering gifts in uh, Romans chapter 12. Uh, and this morning, I want to spend some time with you talking about uh, the... Uh, fruit of the Spirit, or how do we know what the Spirit does in us when we allow Him to do it? And uh, I, I think this is a very significant part, uh, because it is my personal opinion that in the Christian church overall, the presence, the work, the ability, and the assignment of the Holy Spirit is largely overlooked. It is at least under-taught. And, and I don't want to be guilty of under-teaching a really important issue. Uh, because we, I need you to be a, become a very aware of the Holy Spirit. Aware of his presence. Aware of his immediacy into your life. And how to identify when the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. Jesus said before he left, I'm going to go away. And when I go away, I'm going to send to you the Holy Spirit. He will take my place. He will begin doing a work in you intended to finish the work that I've begun. What he has begun in your life, the Holy Spirit will continue and continue to do. And we need to be aware that the Holy Spirit, first of all, when you were saved when you made a commitment to serve Jesus, give your life to him, it was a work of the Holy Spirit. You were saved by the Spirit. You were made alive by the Spirit. And in a certain level uh, of experience, the Holy Spirit comes upon us at that point. It identifies us in the relationship with the family. We recognize this. And I think one of the continuing uh, question spots among Christian people at large is trying to understand God as a triune being, as a trinity. We recognize the phrase God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we just kind of throw that out there as if that's some formula that we use to baptize people or to bless people, or to conclude a prayer time with, not recognizing the fact that each of those definitions are, a, are a, a, um, an explanation of a function, a part of what God does, a part of how God does it. And we recognize that uh, many of the laws of our country and of our world had biblical roots, if you're aware of the fact, the very structure of our uh, American Constitution had highly biblical roots. It is not by accident that our government is set up in th three branches. As God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is three separate functions. Our Constitution is built into three branches of government. The executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And each of those are part of the same government. But each of them have a different function. And if you look at the, the function of God the Father, creator of all things... And then you look at Jesus, the incarnation of the Father into the world. His function was totally different. Dennis mentioned it earlier. Uh, nothing came as a surprise to Jesus. Matter of fact, he was the only one we know, the only person we know, who was literally born to die. Well, that's different than the function of the creator God. 
And then Jesus, in leaving, sending us the Holy Spirit, suddenly that function differs from what the, what the Father d does, what, the, what Jesus did, and now he is in you, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in you by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, we, you, little, you, you hear little voices in your head. You, you ever hear those? Now, some of you, when you say that, I, you kind of scare me a little. But I believe I have learned partly how to trust that the Holy Spirit has spoken to my heart. I so trust that and so depend on that at a daily directional basis. It's kind of like, yes, Lord, I know I've got to do this and this and this and this and this. Tell me the order I need to do this in so I can accomplish these things with you. And suddenly you realize that there's something alive in you that's very important to help you to function. And, it is, and suddenly, and we're going to go back next Sunday to uh, the spiritual giftedness, etc. But I want to spend some time with you this morning on, on discussing with you the fruits, the fruits of the Spirit. And to do that, we need to go to Galatians, of course, chapter, chapter 5. And uh, let me just read some verses of Scripture to you to explain this, can I? Uh, I'm just going to begin, just, just, just lean back and listen to some really encouraging words. You brothers were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. So that you do not do what you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live <clears throat> like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such of these there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking or envying each other. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, when you think about this terminology... They could have said it different. They could have talked about something else being a, other than being a fruit. But it was referred to as a fruit. Uh, how many of you have fruit trees in your yard? Isn't it, a, isn't it fun watching them? I was, I was so excited. Several years ago, I planted a, a, an orange tree. And the first year it grew and it had about two oranges on it. And I thought, oh, right. Then I realized I had it in the wrong place. So I transplanted it. And the next year it didn't do anything. And this year it had the buds everywhere. I thought, all right, I got my orange tree back. And it had some oranges that came out on it. And suddenly I'm looking at it. There's no oranges on it. They all fell off. 
and then realizing I still have it in the wrong place. I have it in a place where it will not flourish. My point being that if you have a fruit tree, you are entitled to certain expectations. I have a nectarine tree that's going to die this year at my hands. <laughs> because it didn't have one nectarine on it this year. Not one. Well, you know what's going to be placed in the place where it was? My orange tree. And it's the right place for it. My, my point is that if you, have a, if you have a fruit tree, there are some expectations that go along with it. If you are a believer, there are expectations on us. If you understand the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, there are expectations on its work into us to do something in us. It is not just the Spirit of God. It is the Holy Spirit. It is a definition of what that Spirit does and is like. If I am filled with the Holy Spirit, I need to become holy like that Spirit. But there's also something interesting else about that fruit thing. And, and that is that if you have a fruit tree, you know what's coming. You know what to expect. And there is an admonition in the book of James, and I'm going to flip over there and read it because it has some really important inputs here. Uh, over in the book of James, um, uh, chapter 3, let's see, where is that? In chapter 3, there is some, well, first of all, you, you, you know the book of James. The book of James is that put both feet in the ground, think right, be logical, be reasonable, be practical in your Christian faith. It is that kind of a book. And, it, and it'll, it'll, it'll raise such issues of how you talk and how you speak and how you think and how you act to each other. And it's so practical of how we do all this. Well, there is a, there's a teaching in the, in the middle of this. Uh, and listen to it. It says, uh, all, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. I don't think that comes as news to any of us, does it? With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. There was something about the way that was said that set me free inside. My brothers, this should not be. He was kind enough because he was the practical Christian liver. He, he, he didn't say, you can't do that. Do it and you'll die. He didn't say that. He said, wait a minute. This should not be. Now, if I say to you, you shouldn't do it, it leaves wide open the door of possibility that it could still be being done in spite of the fact that we shouldn't do it. And there's a lot of things in life that we shouldn't be doing that we still are. But here he said, wait a minute. I, and I want, you, I want you to catch this vision. Here is a fountain. Here's a, a water fountain here. And, and it's filled with sweet water. And so you say, give me a little drink of it. So I give you a little drink of it, and it's salt water. 
And James says, that, that doesn't, that's not consistent. That's not what happens. Now, the issue is, sometimes our sweet nature is expressed in a less than sweet manner. And we say words that we wish, like everything, we could pull back in after we say them. You ever been there? Sure we have. But here again, it says, now, wait a minute. Can this sweet fountain bring forth bitter water just because it's jarred or kicked or abused? He says, no. Bitter water, sweet water doesn't come from the same fountain. And so he says it's possible that suddenly we have something here to work on, and it says, out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. My brothers, this ought not ever to be. Now, I'm, I'm, and i got to fit this into the fruits of the Spirit. I'll tell you why. And just, just remember that thought. Brothers, this ought not to be. Now, here's the list that it should be. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I suggest two things to you. First of all, theologically, I suggest that we could write this differently than he did without changing the intent of it. We could say here, because of what he's already said about let love be foremost in everything and everything, we could say to you that the fruits of the Spirit is summed up in love. Can we say that? And put a, put a, a, a parenthesis right there. The fruit of the Spirit is love defined and expressed in peace, joy, Patience, long-suffering, gentleness. But they're all expressions of love. Then he comes to the end of the list, and he says, and self-control. That's an interesting addition to a list of emotions and a list of character qualities. But again, secondly, to this writing of this whole thing differently, I could write this differently. I can say to you, with, ex with, with all of these things, all of this laid, I can say, and they are only expressed according to your ability of having self-control. Self-control is an interesting addition to a list of emotional character qualities. But suddenly, I really felt blessed by this. You remember, in, well, in, in Ephesians, Paul is doing a good teaching of this new life that they've come into. They're believers. He's talking to a church. And he says, oh, by the way, you who lie, don't lie anymore. I didn't think believers lied. And he says, oh, yes, and you who steal, quit stealing. I didn't think Christians stole. But by the same token, I could add the other list that we read before of cursing and blessing coming from the same mouth. And I says, wait a minute. That's not what Christians do. Except, you know what? That's the world we came out of. We've been transformed by the grace of God and brought into a new life, and we bring into all this new life our imperfections. And I would love to be ultimate in my interpretation of the fact that says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. I'd like to make that so, uh, so complete 
that it includes everything we did wrong before. But have you found that that's not the way it works? So what happens is this. There are certain things that we have to apply by self-discipline and self-control in order to be pleasing to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Don't expect him to do all the heavy lifting. Okay? Don't expect God to do everything for you when he says there are some things that you need to be responsible for. So here we go back again to this. My brothers, this ought not to be. Well, then what is compared to what we teach? Um, we call this process progressive sanctification. In the fundamental core theologic theology of the church of God, as we are a part of, we are a church that believes in sanctification. We believe in entire sanctification. And, and the word says, I would that you were made perfect, all of you, totally, completely. And it's like, yeah, well, I always feel like I'm playing catch up on that game. How about you? I believe in sanctification. Meaning that God, by the Holy Spirit, works in us continually, sanctifying or purifying or getting rid of the stuff that we don't need anymore and making us more holy like the Spirit within us. But we learn to find out in the practical sense that sanctification is more progressive than instantaneous. I love the thought of instantaneous sanctification. I, I love that thought. I love the thought of sinless perfection. Neither of which I claim. <laughs> and some of you don't claim yet. But I remember, I've said this before, and I'm not saying this unkindly in any manner, but I was talking to a wonderful old saintly lady uh, within the Church of God, and as she was talking about the Lord and how good he is, and she says, you know, Pastor, she says, I haven't sinned in 13 years. You know what I want to say to her. <laughs> you just did, you liar. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say it. I respected her hope. I respected her vision of herself. I'm going, go for it. And pray for me that I might catch up with you somehow. Okay? But now, back to the fruit. Fruit. As in your tree, it gives you something to expect. It tells you what's coming. It tells you what's coming next. Most fruit trees start with a spring blossom of some kind. Well, that tells you spring's coming. It also tells you that right behind that flower, as a bee comes along and fertilizes that, uh, that thing in there, <laughs> that there's going to be a fruit that comes along. That's going gonna, that's gonna to be followed up with some other things. Okay, now listen. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, there are some expectations of what follows. Every one of us need to be in a place where we can see ourselves yesterday and today and hope for tomorrow and know that it's progressively upwards and toward the Lord Jesus. Are you comfortable with that? One more verse. A verse that I love to quote to you. Um, and um, I always like to, I always like to um, quote it with my own emphasis. Psalm 
Speaking of self-control. You hearing me? Do not let, do not allow, do not permit any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Okay? I'm glad he said it because he, because he said it, I can say it. <laughs> Do not allow. What does that mean? It means, listen, if you allow it, get ready for something better. If you allow it, quit allowing it. I think this idea of don't permit it implies that apart from the applied self-control, this happens. See, unwholesome talk does come out of our mouth. And we need to, de- we need to add con- self-control to it and, and, and make sure that we discipline ourselves to make sure that we don't say anything. And the next verse on it says, except for what is good for the edifying of the person listening to you. So we speak for somebody else's benefit. The fact that Paul said, you who steal, don't steal anymore, implies that they did. They were. They were believers stealing. You who lie, quit lying. The believers were lying and they could not cut it out. You brothers, this ought not to be. Unkind words out of a sweet fountain. Implication? It happens. Why doesn't or when doesn't it happen? Catch my conclusion. When you apply self-control to the fruit of the Spirit. I don't know how I could preach a more simple message than that to you. But listen, we're here together as fruit in God's vineyard. We are the fruit of the ministry of Jesus who gave himself that we might become everything the Father wanted us to become. And he gave us the Holy Spirit to enable us to become that. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we pause for a moment and we give you thanks for you have blessed us You have spoken to our hearts again about who we are, about who we used to be and who we're becoming. Help us, O Lord, in all that we do that we might set ourselves to please you. And so, Lord, in everything may we add the ministry of the Holy Spirit bearing its fruit in us. Thank you in Jesus' name.